we start with a bunch of nudie naked ladies emerging from some pools. And before you can say, I think this is going to be a good series, lads, one drinks from the central well and promptly gets them all squashed flatter than Prince Elrond's face. But then they wake up in a small field and turns out they all seem to have a nasty gaze of eczema. As they soon shed their phony flaky skin and somehow become stunning and brave native Indian peeps with cleavage covering dresses. Ooh. Ooh. Fuck you. Apparently, the leader is called Shafa of the Choctaw people. And no, Choctaw ain't a fucking Pokemon, son. As a little girl tells us by narration how Chaffa was a total legend and saved her family from the cave simply by drinking some water and then getting her people totally crushed. <sighs> or some shit. Anyway, we then cut to Oklahoma 2007 where a little deaf girl called Maya tells her cousin Bonnie that it's totally pointless waffling on about dopey cave people with nasty skin conditions because I can't hear a word you're saying, pal. And after Maya whines about not having any more hot chocolate in the house, her mum thinks it's a great idea to go out in the middle of a thunderstorm to get some more from the store. But it turns out her brakes are more useless than Anne Heshes, and they soon end up getting wrecked in a nasty crash, where little Maya comes round to see a shard of glass through her foot and her mum totally deadied. And before she can say, you know, I wasn't even that bothered about the hot chocolate to be honest, her dad takes her away to the city after his relatives hold him responsible for his wife's death, given he's apparently in a dodgy gang and some rivals cut the brakes to get to him and she. And after telling his daughter to get over being deaf already and then getting her a new prosthetic limb, he soon sticks her in the local smack em up club where she soon matures and gets pretty good at smacking people up, including strapping young blokes who still have all four limbs. And if you're thinking those scenes were somehow familiar, well, turns out that whole sequence was lifted straight from that Hawkeye show from a few years ago. And we're now seemingly having to sit through recycled footage disguised as flashbacks, given the Disney filmmakers are cheap gits and can't be asked to write or film anything new. <clears throat> so naturally, we then cut to another scene from that Hawkeye show what no one watched from over two years ago, where said hooded Hawkeye fella appeared to kill her Indian daddy. Aww. After having some sort of grief-induced meltdown and also launching an expensive motorbike at a bunch of cops for some reason, the deaf lass gets picked up by her dad's old boss, Mr. Kingpin, who says, listen, girl, I know you're still upset about your dead engine daddy, but launching flash motorbikes at random traffic cops just ain't fucking on, son. And this Wilson Fisk fella totally bonds with her by telling her all about his tragic backstory and how his own daddy was killed when he was 12 and it made him well mad and all. So he totally knows all about how she's feeling right now and wants to help her release her rage by recruiting her to be his chief goon. And before you can say, what's the point of having an interpreter in the car if you're not even going to look at what she's signing? We cut to her first ever assignment as one of the Kingpin's naughty forces, where she mostly just stands around being useless whilst her colleagues get seven shades of shite smacked out of him. Nice. And it's only after she's directly tackled that she finally starts snapping necks. And rather literally, as Maya finally puts her childhood smack em up skills to good use when a dodgy bloke in a red leather gimp suit appears and starts doing ludicrous spinny kicks. And turns out it's that daredevil fella from that pretty sweet Netflix show back in the day. You know, that universally beloved and critically acclaimed masterpiece which was inexplicably cancelled because reasons? God damn do I wish I was watching that show right about now. And it looks like it's curtains for the next snapping one-legged murderer whose mum had died over some hot chocolate. But luckily, she smacks him up and all, until he just randomly leaves off screen, presumably in embarrassment. And after she returns to Fisk's HQ to tell him all about how she just spent her evening getting sweaty with a surprisingly supple blind man, he's super impressed that a peg-legged deaf bird lasted longer in battle than most of his whole squad of highly trained men with working limbs and ears. And he says they're totally family now that she's found her place in the world and can smack up Catholic lawyers real good. <sighs> Some shit. So after a montage of her doing a bunch of bad things, he says he's working on finding her daddy's killer so she can totally get her revenge. <coughs> we then cut back to more scenes from the Hawkeye show. And you can tell it's from that two-year-old series simply by how less chubby the actress's face was back then. Anyway, said Hawkeye fella appears in the flashback 
And I guess this was clearly before he got himself run over by his own snowplow somehow. Bruh. And Soam revealed how Fisk was the one who killed her dodgy engine daddy. So naturally, she then went off to confront him in a small alley. Which, if you remember, takes place just after the writers of that show were done emasculating and humiliating the character by letting him get beaten by a small girl and then blown to kingdom come by someone who wasn't even the title character or even an Avenger. And after he tries to convince her not to make his night even worse by getting punked by yet another woman in one evening, he desperately tries to remind her that they're meant to be some sort of a family. But Maya just shrugs and shoots him point blank in the eye. Then we cut to five months later. And finally, finished with all the flashback catch-up scenes only 28 minutes into a 43 minute show, as a randomly injured Maya goes back to her childhood home to rest up after killing a notorious crime boss in New York City last Christmas. And after having some more spooky dreams about the nudie Yankee Choctaw peeps who love getting crushed in small caves, she soon reunites with her other cousin called Biscuits. And I promise you, I ain't making that up. And he instantly recognises her, despite saying they ain't seen each other in 20 years. Because apparently she still looks the same. And before she can say, well actually I had an extra foot back then you insensitive git. This biscuit boy, what seems to be wearing a trans pride vest for some reason, says he'll totally respect her request not to tell all the fam that she's back in town. And promptly gets back to smooching his dog. Okay. Later, she spies on that bonnie lass playing basketball in front of some fire trucks because apparently the local fire service are neck deep in diversity, equity and inclusion programs and clearly think it's a great idea to recruit small women to carry unconscious people out burning buildings, move heavy equipment at rapid pace and put up raging fires on top floors of giant tower blocks before she heads off to the local teeny bopper disco. What's also so inclusive these days that even prepubescent cripples and wobbly kids can join in the fun. As a straight white desk clerk bloke says she looks rather familiar despite supposing never having met her before. Because I guess all native Indians look the same to Caucasian men. Or at least when written by leftist Marvel writers, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, she soon visits her uncle Henry, who's currently in the middle of his DJ set. But hilariously, she says she wants to talk in private. And before you can say, is that really necessary when no one can hear you over the blaring music and you're just going to be doing sign language that most peeps ain't going to understand anyway? That shoe-shining racialist desk clerk sends an ominous text message about trading info on the Kingpin's killer for a potential bounty. As Henry brings in a doctor to patch Maya up properly, given she just used a sticky dental floss to dress her own wound last night. Oh! Later, they climb to the top of some sort of nearby tower to totally spy on that bonnie chick some more. And he says you should probably go visit your cousin, what you ain't seen for 20 years, given you're back in town and less than 100 feet away spying on her through a small telescope. But she says she don't want to talk to no stinking female fireman lady, what's clearly a diversity hire. So shut up about it already. And instead goes on to ask him for one of his train cars on his shipping route, in order to do some vague shit to Fisk's men and totally send him a message. Despite him being dead and her already having got her vengeance by blowing his noggin off in sheet. But although Uncle Henry don't really want to start a war in his small town for absolutely no fucking reason, she just says that that kingpin fella has had his run, and now it's time for a study to brave queenpin already. And again, not a joke. And we end with said kingpin fella waking up in the local hospital and just missing his left eye. Causing a shocking twist, what no one could ever see coming. Turns out the classic comic book character played by a fan favourite actor, and that's also been featured heavily in all the trailers for upcoming episodes, and is even currently shooting a new season of freaking Daredevil right now, has totally survived a point blank shot to the face because reasons. And that's it. That's the first epic. Though my favourite part was discovering this 43 minute premiere, which included 28 minutes of flashbacks and also intercut with existing archive footage from two fucking years ago, was written by no less than four separate writers. And all I can say is, if you need four freaking writers to make a show about a deaf woman who doesn't even speak proper dialogue, then I don't think there's any hope for Marvel at this point. But anyway, that's a blot and that's a lot. Considering that bell thing, so you don't miss any future recaps. Tell me if you liked this episode in the comments if you have time. And I'll see you in the next one.